is Crypto the Future. Welcome to episode 2, Money in Practice in Many Countries. So today we're learning from home and I'm going to try something a little different. I don't want to show my face, but I, maybe I'm okay so showing my Bitmoji. So here's my Bitmoji trying to educate you guys from home. Previously in science, we discussed how people traded using the obsidian arrowheads. Uh, they traded cowrie shells. And then we talked about the story of Mansa Musa. Oh, he has so much gold and how he made it rain gold in Egypt. Um, we also talked about having a lot of a currency and how maybe having a, like a whale that has so much of a currency is maybe not the best for the future of that currency. So a lot of different ideas to think about. And today we're going to continue thinking about if in our world there is a future where, uh, you know, some of the major currencies in trade right now, USD, euros, yen, pounds, Chinese yuan, etc. That we're going to convert them into crypto. So let's talk. Let's th think about how that has happened in the past in the world to see if this could happen in the future. Um, so we talked about episode one, and so episode two, we're going to talk about coins in practice. So we're going to look at different countries. Let's start with Ecuador, specifically Ecuador in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. And so. Ecuador during this time used uh, the Sucre coin and so you know here we see some pictures of what those look like and the problem with the Sucre was that it was having some pretty high inflation um, and so you know it was pegged to the dollar at one point and then over time the central bank just had to peg more and more and more Sucres to one dollar and so in 1995 you know it was what three thousand to a dollar and then by uh, 2000 it was twenty five thousand right so it's very rapid inflation in a very short amount of time, uh, which is very alarming. And so the government was like, well, what do we do? Uh, and they realized that there were other Latin American countries that didn't have their own coin. They just used dollars. And so Ecuador was like, hold my cerveza. And they were like, maybe we can dollarize too. And so eventually what, what was the practice that was happening was that people would get paid and their sucres and then they would immediately rush to the to the uh to the bank to exchange it for dollars because they would you know the the coin was losing value so rapidly um and so ecuador just kind of went all in and they were like well, let's just use dollars if everybody's using that currency anyway and so you know you might be wondering well how did that how did the how did they get all all this money why did the u.s give them all this money the answer is they didn't right so the u.s paid for the goods that ecuador produced you know, so Ecuador produced bananas, Ecuador produced oil, uh, a bunch of uh, different uh, seafood and crustaceans and stuff. And so, you know, Ecuador didn't get this for free. Like they actually they had to physically exchange a lot of goods, a lot of value to get dollars in their economy. Um, but but there's good news. It worked. So their massive inflation that even reached 100 percent eventually, you know, essentially just turned into like the, the U.S. inflation. Um, you know, because they were just using dollars. Um, and so it kind of shows the effect of what happens when a government uh, has a little bit of trouble. Um, their currency starts having a lot of trouble too. Japan. Specifically in uh, 500 to 1500 uh, uh, common era. So before this time, Japan was using uh, arrowheads, rice, and gold dust as a currency, which might you know, bring some memories of people using uh, the, you know, like the obsidian arrowheads. People were using that in Japan too. Um, but there was a time when there, you know, in the in the 1700 or 700, 800, where uh, there was a government and they it did issue a coin. Uh, but eventually, the government kind of fell apart. And so there were these coins that Japan used for a while. But then, when the government fell apart, so did the coins. Um, and so, in medieval Japan, later on. Um, you know, so the history here is apparently that Korea was stable, China was stable, Vietnam was stable, but Japan wasn't. And so, um, because they weren't, a lot of people took the piracy. And so they started raiding all these different, um, uh, other Asian territories. And I think they call this like, like, like Waku piracy. Um, but anyway, uh, the, you know, part of this was piracy, part of this was also trade, but Japan started just adopting the Chinese coin. And there eventually were towns in China that exported coins to Japan in exchange for goods. Um, I did try to find 
and go like search what those goods were like back you know back in the medieval era but i couldn't quite find what they were trading um and and you know apparently the chinese coin was so good that people in japan started imitating the chinese coin and using that for trade as well uh, and so you can see some of the diagrams there on the slides um so it's just kind of interesting that you know people adopt other you know japan adopted another country's coin just because their government effectively was was not there india so this was india in 100 bce um you know did a lot of research on india and um you know definitely rich history but the monetary history is uh you know I, I didn't find like a lot that had a direct parallel to like the cryptocurrency era uh at least not back you know in older times but what i did find was that um you know in the you know third century 200 bce that they had these coins that were different shapes and they had different uh, symbols on them but then at this point greece started rising greece you know alexander the great started conquering and um and so then the indian coin started adopting the uh the practice of putting like faces and people on the coin and they call these indo greeks um and so it's interesting here that you know there's a par parallel with you know other cryptocurrencies learning from each other and then trying to do something better and so you know the one example i thought of is that litecoin um, is a similar protocol to bitcoin it's just you know made so you can do more transactions and so forth uh, so money does learn from each other um you know wonder if we'll see that with some of the major currencies today china and so here we're going to talk about china in the 1700 to 1900 and you know we've talked about china with the cowrie shells and one of the things you might remember is uh, the opium wars, op opium wars that happened during this time. Um, but without focusing too much on the, on the you know the, the political struggle, I did want to focus a little bit more on the economics. And so, you know, during this time, Britain wanted Chinese silk, they wanted Chinese tea, they wanted Chinese porcelain. So they wanted all these Chinese goods, but they didn't have a lot to offer back to China because China was fairly well developed and they didn't want whatever Britain was manufacturing. And so what they could offer was silver. And it was lots and lots of silver that started making its way into China. And you might be wondering, well, well why did Britain have all the silver? And so there's a funny backstory here that said actually Spain was, you know, had, had, had started conquering, you know, the Latin American world in, you know, 1500, 1600. And so they were, they amassed all the silver and Spain, um, minted that silver into into their own currency and in effect it became the world currency um you know like the silver pieces of eight or whatever um i think i saw that reference in my research um eventually you know <laughs> spain went down but then the silver world currency kind of uh snuck into great britain and so great britain started minting silver as well uh, and this is part of why the British coin is called the pound sterling because there was a point where it was based off of silver uh, on the silver standard anyway so Britain had all the silver and it was making its way into China and eventually all the silver was going into China that China then was decided hey we're gonna go on the silver standard too and they did and then they started minting their own silver coins um, so interesting lesson here that uh, you know, they would exchange their goods for the one good that they like, silver, and then they started using that as a currency. And so you got to wonder if the future of the world where we get to the point where there's a country that's just like, you know, we'll just take Bitcoin or we'll just take Ethereum or whatever. Uh, you know, that could facilitate the, facilitate the adoption of a cryptocurrency in the future as well. Rome. And y'all, there is a lot to look into in Rome. Uh, so we're going to focus here more into like the empire part of the <laughs> of the of the roman country roman empire roman time um and so you know again there's a lot of stories here but you know just want to focus on the denarius and so this is just a, the roman coin and so apparently it was uh, a coin that was largely silver earlier in the roman empire but then as as uh time progressed uh the coin got debased and so you know apparently it, like you know the original coins were like 95 percent silver but then like 300 years later they were only like five percent silver and so you can see in the diagram uh you know it, it's less and less white less and less white metal and more and more you know bronze looking um and so you know rome had troubles because they had to pay their soldiers in silver you know the soldiers 
very important to the Roman government. And if the soldiers weren't paid well, then there was going to be problems. And so the government funneled a lot of their effort and a lot of their economy to feeding the army uh, silver. And this kind of took value away from other parts of the economy. Um, and so again, this was before, um, you know, people were, you know, printing paper money or whatever. And so the silver kind of had to come from somewhere, but then the silver didn't, you know, for some reason it didn't make its way back into the economy. I don't know what the soldiers were doing with it. Um, and so people started, again, having to use these cheaper coins uh, for their economic transactions. Um, and so the government couldn't tax the silver, enough silver to pay their army. Um, and so they started doing something weird where they mandated, you know, at first they mandated people to, to collect taxes for them. Um, and then they started forcing people to collect taxes for them, kind of like the, like the mayor of a town. Hey, make your people pay me taxes, and if not, you have to pay them. And then when that started running into problems, they started at, at making people pay in value. And so what, what this meant was, like if you manufacture shoes, you had to pay the government a portion of the shoes. Or if you, you know, built boats, then you had to give the government, uh, you know, rides on your boats. Or, um, you know, if you were a blacksmith, you had to, like, you know, create all this metal stuff for them. And, you know, that worked for a while. But then what happens when you pass away? Well, now your kid has to do your work. And so, you know, what started happening was when the edges, the frontiers of the Roman society, uh, you know, started facing pressure from the barbarians, people were like yeah, come on in, because I'd rather do whatever I want than the Roman government making me build shoes just because my dad made shoes or whatever. And so, you know, and there's even like a funny ad anecdote about coins from Nero and coins from Trajan and whatever. Um, and, and ultimately this led to, this was, again, a lot of history here, but this led to the downfall of the Roman society. Um, and, you know, you gotta wonder, like, is this something that could happen with with the US dollar? Uh, you know, maybe not because we don't, you know, have to physically mine silver to back a currency. The government just kind of prints it. So, so a, you know, a little, little bit different situation. Um, and even if you were somebody that held on to a denarius or even held on to a gold denarius, that doesn't necessarily help you when a lot of society is falling apart. Uh, so what are the overall lessons? Uh, is Bitcoin coins to the moon? Maybe, but would it make sense to say I'm going to hold a denarius to the moon? Um, and the answer is like, well, maybe not. At least history hasn't shown that to be the case. And so, you know, we have to think about the future of cryptocurrencies. You know, one of the things that, I, you know, I struggled to find in my, you know, my research of different currencies was a, was a melt up. You know, like like if you had a dollar, did it ever melt up? If you had a, you know, Japanese yen or euro or whatever, did it ever just like explode in value and, and it didn't and so you know or at least not that I could find and so you got you know, like like there's something different going on with the cryptocurrencies if if they're doing this melt up right like they're not exactly currencies they're more stores of value so it's a little different way to think about it um, another lesson to think about is that you know at the end of the day the government is going to determine the coin right so the government is what's determining what's going to be traded the government determines how it collects its taxes and you know, and if it happens that in your part of the world, the government is weak, then it's the world government, you, you, you know, your, your Spain's, your Britain's, your, you know, US's or, you know, maybe an Asian country in the future, they're going to be determining what the world currency is. And, you know, that's what you got to pay attention to. Um, I did want to sh uh, shout out this article by um, uh, Lynn Alden. She talked about Bitcoin's network effect and how that kind of gives insight into the value. And, you know, she talked about you know, if you want to replace something that's already in the network, it has to be 10 times better. Uh, you know, the article talked about MySpace and Facebook and stuff. And so so I, I think there's a lot here. I think this article is worth sharing. Just wanted to uh, mention that, again, there's different ways to kind of think about the value of, of something. So this concludes episode two. Here are my sources. So thank you guys for listening. I hope this was educational, different things to think about. Uh, again, there's a whole lot more. Check out the sources down in the uh in the description and uh episode three will come out <laughs> later thank you